Hello and welcome back to MFX Modules Series, a collection of useful mini Houdini setups for those who want to get their knowledge on. As always, support is much appreciated. Please like, subscribe, and check the video description for links to relevant project files. Module 5 will cover my basic version of the spring solver technique that we can use to add jiggle and temporal smoothing to our heavier setups. For heavy setups, using a solver seems to be a lot more efficient and scale a lot better than something like chops. So let's get in there and learn how it all works. So I gotta admit, when I first went and built this solver, I was using Wikipedia and kind of looking up formulas and stuff, but I still do have my physics tech book from college that um, I wanted to see in here if it had the formula that we'd be using. And certainly enough on page 471, I don't know if you can see it, but it's gonna hold this one up here. That little guy right there is the one that we need. It's that little function right there. So we're gonna be putting that together in VEX. And uh, yeah, just a good old physics textbook laying around. Doesn't get any nerdier than that. <laughs> All right, so to give us something interesting to spring, I'm just gonna copy over module one here from the project file. So I'm just gonna copy this first little transition that we made here and paste it into a fresh scene. I'm gonna first create a geo to contain it and we'll dive inside and paste that in right here. So we kind of built in a springy looking thing into this when we first built it. You can kind of see that it transitions and kind of wobbles a little bit here. I'm just gonna remove that so that we can use our solver to kind of achieve that effect. So let's go to the map transition. I'm gonna just alt click the burger here and then non alt click it, just vanilla click it to pop it off to the side there. So I have this kind of lined up like so. And I'm gonna just reset this to linear. And let's see here, we've got a pretty gradual transition still. So I'm gonna make this a lot more harsh by, um, I'm just gonna middle click the last keyframe on the map transition and bring it closer to frame 72. And then I'm going to make this transition with very sharp, let's say 0.1. So we get a very harsh transition like this. And we can then use our spring solver to sort of smooth this out and make it look jiggly and nice. So to construct a spring solver, we're gonna need a solver. So let's throw one of those down and we'll uh, wire in our mapped transition and let's dive inside here. So the way that this is gonna work is instead of actually working on our input geometry and referencing our previous frame, we're actually gonna work on our previous frame and reference the future frame, the next frame. So we're gonna have input two go into our second input on our spring solver. This first input is gonna sort of act like it's dragging the spring around and getting it to sort of pull towards whatever the next frame is, each iteration of the solve. So let's throw down a wrangle here. We'll wire the previous frame into the first input and the first input into the second input of the wrangle. And then we'll wire the output to the wrangle, like so. So with our wrangle, now what do we do in here? Well, let's think about the things that we know. We know the position of our current point on our geometry. We know the position of our next point on our geometry. So the change in position is equal to the velocity. And the change in velocity is equal to the acceleration. And so if we can compute our acceleration each frame based off of this spring force that we have, we're gonna be able to integrate our velocity and use it to change our position according to whatever this spring force should be. So let's take a look at what these forces actually look like in terms of formulas. So the first force that we need is the spring force. So let's write that down here. We've got the spring force F of S is equal to negative K X. So X is the distance between the current position of the you know, thing at the end of the spring and the position that the goal rest length of the, of the spring. And negative K is the spring constant that just is sort of a stiffness value more or less is the way I like to think of it, but it helps determine how tightly things should be pulled towards that initial position. The next force we got is the damping force. So F at D is equal to negative B V. And B is our damping coefficient and V is our current velocity. So the damping force is pushing in the opposite direction of our current velocity and just causing things to slow down a little bit. Otherwise our spring would just oscillate back and forth forever. So this is gonna cause it to slowly die out and reach a state of equilibrium after some time. So the total force we're going to compute each frame 
is going to be the sum of these two forces. So we write that kind of like this. We look all fancy math, making a sigma f for the sum of all forces. And then we can just set that equal to negative kx minus, because we're adding, but these are minus signs here. So minus bv. So this is our total formula for our force that we want each frame. So what is a force? The force is just as we know with Newton's second law equal to ma. So f equals ma. And if we know that, like we were saying before, that the acceleration is the change in velocity and the velocity is the change in position, if we can get our acceleration, then we're going to be all good to integrate and eventually update our position correctly. So we just need to kind of solve for acceleration here. So we know if we have our total force, all we have to do is take that force and divide it by the mass. We just rearrange this algebraically saying the acceleration equals the uh, force over the mass. So with these two formulas over here in mind, we can build out some formulas in VEX that accomplish this. So let's hop over into our wrangle and do that. So the first thing, we're gonna define our own variables for the spring constant. So this K variable, we're gonna find that. We're gonna find our own variable for the damping coefficient, this B here. And we're also gonna define a variable for our mass which I mostly just usually leave to one, but I'll make a little float slider for it just in case we wanna experiment with that. So let's go over here and we will define three float values. So float M equals CHF mass. And then float K equals CHF, we'll just call this stiffness. And then float B equals another CHF channel float, call this damping and we'll unquote it like so. And then we need to compute, if we look over here, we need to compute what this X value is. This X value is going to be the distance between here and where our goal position is, the goal position of the spring, which in our case is going to be whatever position this is on this second input right here. So we need to look that up. We're gonna do that using a point function. So we're gonna switch, we're gonna go down here and create a new vector and this is gonna be P2, so our, our second position. And that's going to be an attribute lookup, a point attribute lookup. So we're gonna use the point function. We're gonna look at the second geometry here by designated by this number one right here. And the attribute we're looking up is P, and we're doing it for every point number, like so. But that is not all. We have now this second position here, but what we're really concerned with is the difference in the, our position versus that position. So we actually just need to calculate this by taking the difference between our position and that position. So that's gonna be another vector. Vector X is equal to our current position minus that P2 value. Now that we've sort of defined our main variables that we have here, we can start to actually plug them into this force formula right here. So let's do that. We're gonna create a force vector. So let's make a new line here. Vector F is going to be equal to this big function that we made right here. So negative KX minus BV. Negative K times X minus B times O. Now we don't have V, do we? So V is actually going to be carried around each frame. So we're gonna to wanna to actually define a attribute to store that. And the way I like to do that when I have something inside of a solver is to not just define it on the regular velocity attribute, but to put it on a special local velocity attribute that I usually write with starting with an underscore. So we're gonna say V at underscore V. And the reason why I like to use the underscore as the first symbol in the attribute is so that I know that it's just easy for me to clean out. I can just wildcard underscore star when I do an attribute delete later and it'll delete all attributes that I store locally that start with an underscore. So I'm not gonna overwrite any existing velocities. I don't wanna do that. I'm just gonna have this local velocity that'll get updated each frame. So we have our force here. Now we need to convert this into an acceleration. And like we had before here, we know that our acceleration is just equal to whatever this force is we're creating divided by the mass. So I'm going to hop over here and we're gonna define the vector A for acceleration. And that's just going to be equal to F over M. And you know that we defined M up here before. Now all there is to do is to integrate it. So we're gonna say V at underscore V 
plus equals a. Because acceleration is a change in velocity, we're just going to add that acceleration to our velocity. And then to actually finally update our position, we're going to say v at p plus equals v at underscore v, like so. And so that should actually do it. Let's click this button so that we get our little variables here. And I think a good place to start is a mass of one, a stiffness of 0.1, and a damping of 0.1. Now I'm gonna jump up by hitting the U key and go up to my solver here. And then I'm gonna pin this just to make sure that this top level of our solver is visible. And let's see what we get. So you can see that we've got this nice kind of jiggly wavy uh, thing that comes on here. Now we don't see our attribute anymore because we're not actually passing through the current frame. We're actually losing that all this attribute information from this transition that we have here. So we can actually pass this back to our geometry and, and pass through our mainstream of geometry every frame so that our attributes still update accordingly. And we're just going to do a little swap using an attribute copy. So let's run on an attribute copy. And the only thing we're going to do, the only thing we want from this solver is to steal the position from it. And we also need to steal this velocity attribute so it can carry through to the previous frame correctly. So we're going to put our first input on the left of our attribute copy, and we're going to be copying the attributes from this attribute wrangle. The attributes we want to copy are the, we're just going to type it in here, position, P, and also I'm just putting in a space there and then typing in the underscore V so that we can get that velocity uh, that we're calculating over here and we'll just wire this out. So now if I hop back up, highlight our solver and rewind, we should be able to see our mask playing along with it as well. So that means that our attributes are being updated, our positions are being updated. So that's it, the spring solver is sort of done. Now, one thing that I would really recommend doing at this point is at least promoting these three attributes, right? or these three parameters right here up onto the solver level. And probably the best thing to do would just be to create an HD out of this. Honestly, that's what I've done, but we'll go through the process of promoting them at least to the solver level. And then we just got to clean up this velocity attribute because I don't want that laying around. So let's go back up here to the top. I'm going to select the solver and click the gear button and say edit parameter interface. And we'll slide this over here, hop into the solver. I'm gonna grab the mass and drag it over here, the stiffness, drag it over here, and the damping and drag it over here. And we'll hit apply and accept. And if we jump up, we have our sliders right here. And here we can start messing around. So if we increase the stiffness parameter, you can see that we get like a much quicker vibration in our geometry. If we increase the damping parameter, you can see that it almost like makes this spring go, the springiness go away. Let's bring that down to a value of 0.3, maybe. See what that looks like. You can see that it, it fades off much quicker. So you can play around with these different values and get different results. A lot of times what I like to do is keep my stiffness pretty low and mess with my damping. And it can provide some really good temporal smoothing for glitchy sims. You can see this is very, you almost don't see any springy behavior on it, but it's just very, very mellow. Now, if we middle mouse click on this, we can see that we have this underscore V attribute. And so any attributes that I kind of like just temporarily want to use inside of my solver, I just kind of like denote them with an underscore in front so that I can easily delete them by doing this. So we're just going to throw down a attribute delete. And for point attributes, I just want to delete everything that starts with underscore. So just putting an underscore star will delete everything except we'll, we'll delete only that underscore attribute. So if I have other attributes that I want to temporarily store, I'll just throw an underscore in front of them and it'll delete all of them. So we had this underscore V here, totally gone now. This is sort of the core of the spring solver. Now you could get more advanced with this and try and make it so that it could uh, work on float attributes or any attribute, any arbitrary attribute. And we might cover that in the future. I don't know. And uh, so, yeah, this one is a super handy one. I use it all the time. And uh, I know that it got a little into the weeds there with the physics lesson, but I sort of have a hidden passion for that um, because I learned a lot about that when I was younger in, in college and stuff like that. So hopefully you thought this was fun and I'll catch you in a new lesson soon.